<coughs> okay, so thanks for the invitation. So this is a joint work with my two co-author here. So Samuel is uh, my PhD student. Uh, Charles is in Bordeaux in France, and uh, Jolene is in Caen. And the topic is uh, trying to understand better uh, what we call uh, sparse analysis uh, priors. So first of all, I will uh, briefly describe uh, and contrast what we call uh, uh, sparse synthesis prior, which is the most common uh, sparsity prior, and uh, analysis uh, sparsity. And then I will try to show how you can actually extend most of the uh, known results in terms of stability um, of the synthesis prior to uh, the analysis setting. And also I would like to give some insight about the proof that I think is quite important because it's exactly related to the first talk of Rodolphe this morning where we're trying to track uh, the support and to show some robustness of the support. So of course it's a different support because now we are in analysis settings, but it's a very general uh, type of proof which has some limitation but uh, that we can actually carry over very easily. Okay, so first of all, what is uh, this prior we consider? So I will take the example of inverse problem in image, uh, image processing, but of course it's a general kind of, of methodology. So in image processing, we are interested in solving uh, inverse problems. So you have uh, typically an operator that map high resolution images or signal to low resolution signals, and most of the time you have noise, and you want to have methods that are robust against both the fact that it's uh, ill posed and also the fact that you have noise. So typical example, so you can have in painting where you remove uh, some pixels, uh, you could have super resolution, you want to increase the number of pixels, uh, and of course compress sensing where the matrix is actually uh, realization of some uh, random distribution. And the general setup here is uh, using some kind of regularization. So here we consider a Lagrangian formalism where you have a data fidelity. So in my talk here I will only use L2 fidelity, it's very simple. It's kind of a Gaussian noise assumption, but quite uh, standard here, and some kind of regularity. And uh, when dealing with sparsity, so here for me sparsity will be, will be uh, only L1 sparsity. Just uh, we focus on this kind of sparsity. You can uh, consider first of all the classical synthesis sparsity, where you have coefficients, and the variable you will uh, keep track of is actually the coefficients, and then you create an image through a linear mapping. So a typical example in image processing is simply a web based basis. That is quite uh, well uh, adapted for uh, natural images. And then you plug this and you consider the optimization on the coefficients themselves and you have the L1 norm of the coefficients themselves. Okay, and this is uh, what we call uh, synthesis parts. In contrast, analysis uh, regularization does exactly the contrary. Your variable of optimization would be the image itself, not the coefficients. And what you will consider is some kind of correlation of the image with uh, your atoms. So maybe the most popular uh, analysis prior is the so-called total variation, TV prior, uh, where the correlation is just in fact computing the derivative in the x direction and in the, y, uh, in the y direction. But very generally speaking, you are just considering here a linear operator, this star, from uh, your image to some correlation space. Okay, and for simplicity, I, I use the same letter alpha here, but remember that these two are, in most of the cases, very, very different. And the optimization uh, then is slightly different because here you see you have your dictionary here that is uh, in some sense inside the L1 norm. So this makes the computation numerically a little bit more uh, complicated. So I will not speak today about how you can actually solve this two convex problem. So this one are uh, slightly more complicated because of this uh, operator inside the L1 norm. But of course also the behavior will be uh, very different. And this is why I will try uh, to explain now. Just to recap, the setting is different because here your variable uh, is actually alpha and you multiply on the left by your dictionary. And here the variable is uh, the signal, the image uh, itself, and you multiply here uh, also by an operator to get the correlation. Okay? But keep in mind maybe the TV framework is uh, the simplest. So here for simplicity, I've displayed so the TV uh, model here, your computing gradient, so at each pixel you have actually a 2D vector. So this is why I display this using uh, two colors uh, to display the gradient as, as uh, simply uh, a color image. And here for those who know, uh, it's actually, if you use the L1 norm, it's going to be uh, what we call uh, anisotropic uh, total variation, where you sum uh, the L1 norm of the gradient, so meaning the derivative in the x direction and in the y direction. Okay, so unless the, uh, your dictionary T is equal to the Psi dictionary and they are both orthogonal, then of course these two are giving very different uh, solutions. And of course in the TD case, it's very far from being an orthogonal dictionary. 
Okay, so just to recap, I will consider this general uh, minimization here. So I have the phi operator and the t uh, operator. I call it uh, p lambda. I put uh, explicitly the dependency on lambda and y because I want to study this dependency. And in the case where I have no noise, I let lambda goes to zero, and of course I solve uh, this constraint uh, problem. So the three question we are interested in, having a better understanding of this regularization, is first of all, what is the impact of the two parameters y and lambda? Then, uh, can you give some kind of criteria on the signal, x, to ensure that uh, in the noiseless case you actually recover exactly uh, your signal? So, implicitly, I mean w is 0 and I let lambda go to 0 to answer the problem. And what is more interesting is to understand the robustness to noise, and I want to consider two settings. First of all, when the noise goes to 0, what I call uh, small noise settings, it's some kind of asymptotic to look for a linear convergence of the error uh, towards 0. And the second setup, which is uh, maybe more interesting for the uh, imaging application, is when you have large noise. And you also want to have uh, some kind of a linear uh, bound here. But of course, the constraint will be different when the noise is, is large. Okay? So let me uh, emphasize the fact that in the synthesis case, so when d is equal to zero, uh, to identity in this optimization, then everything is quite well known. And that bit back to the uh, work of Jean-Jacques Fuchs, who is in Rennes, and uh, Joel Tropp as already mentioned in the, in the first case, uh, in the first talk. And in the analysis uh, setting, much less is, uh, is, is known, actually, which is kind of uh, weird because it looks like very similar to the synthesis case. And the only previous uh, work is the work of Nan, who is a uh, student of uh, Rémi Cribonval, very recently. And the study is a case where there is no noise. They give a criteria to answer to this question. But the problem is that this criteria uh, does not uh, guarantee robustness. So in this, in this talk, I will give you a different criteria that are not better or, or worse than the criteria of Remy. There are some key differences. Okay? Uh, but this criteria can give robustness to noise. And we'll give this to noise. Okay, first of all, let me uh, try to describe how you can actually very easily uh, compute uh, the local behavior of the sparse regularization when you uh, modify a little bit the observation y or a little bit uh, the regularization. As, as you will see, it's quite easy, also a little bit technical. Uh, what you need to do and uh, to use is the first order optimality uh, condition uh, of your problem. So it's a convex problem, so it's very convenient. And the most important thing, and it's exactly what has already been introduced uh, in the first talk, is the support of the solution. But since here we are in an analysis case, the support is the support of the correlation. Of course, it's not the support of the image, it's the support of the correlation. So for instance, uh, if you consider the TV model, so here it's in 1D, okay, what is the support? Uh, it's uh, the point where the derivative is non-zero, and if you have a piecewise constant here, it will be exactly the jump location. Okay, but it's more general. You can consider more general operators than derivative. You could consider second order derivative, third order derivative. It would be exactly the same. You will look for the value, the index, where your operator, your correlation is, is non-zero. And what is associated to this is the union of subspace model. Okay? It's uh, in fact the subspace where uh, locally the solution uh, will live. Okay? And uh, because you uh, typically want to constrain the support to stay constant locally, what you are looking for is, is signals that are in uh, this linear space, uh, I call uh, them uh, GJ, okay? which is just the kernel of uh, your operator D, where you have uh, extracted the column that are zero, or it's orthogonal to the image of, of this operator. Okay? What is it in this case? It's very easy, it's simply the set of signals that has that are piecewise constant and that share the same singularity as your initial uh, input. Meaning you can uh, basically move this guy up and down, but you don't, you cannot move uh, the position of the discontinuity. Okay? And as you change the discontinuity, this gives you a union of space model. So it's just basically a generalization of the union of space you have in classical sparsity, while you restrict the position of the Dirac. Okay? So, of course, what is important here is to uh, set up the first order condition. And of course, I want to introduce uh, my constraint on the support. So, you are asking for zero to be in the sub-differential. Okay? And I make explicit uh, the fact that uh, on the support, you actually know the, the sub-differential. It's just the sign of your discontinuities here. Yeah? But outside, of course, the sub-differential can be arbitrary, except it has to be of infinite norm of zero than one. Okay, so for those who know, it's exactly the same as what you do when you are in classical synthesis of sparsity, except you have this uh, nasty uh, here operator, DJ, that in some sense obscure uh, the sigma. It's a little bit more tricky, but it's exactly the same kind of, of equation you have to deal. So basically, this equation is equivalent to having a solution. Okay, now what can you do with this? 
Uh, of course, it's kind of your opposite solution uh, equation because you have both x star and sigma that you don't know about. So what you do is you want to kill the sigma to obtain some kind of more explicit uh, expression in terms of x star. And to be able to do that, uh, you need to cancel the effect of your operator. And uh, of course, you need some kind of, of stability, uh, an impose some stability of your operator on the set, on the set uh, here, gj. So what you will impose, which is very classical, is the fact that your operator, which is very imposed, is actually invertible on your subspace. Okay, so for instance, you can think about TV and <coughs> again. So you impose that on the set of signals that are piecewise constant with fixed discontinuities, your operator is invertible. Most of the time, if you think about filtering, for instance, it's going to be true. Okay, so now the opposite equation is just about uh, projecting this original equation on uh, GJ here to kill this guy and uh, invert phi star <coughs> uh, on GJ. Okay. This use this kind of nasty equation, but in fact it's a very uh, simple equation because the first term here okay, is actually just uh, simply uh, the linear regression of y on uh, gj. Okay. And here you have a little bias, as you have uh, with classical L1 norm, except it's a little bit more tricky to express this bias, but you see the influence of lambda here is just impacted impact by uh, this bias. Okay. And, that, and there is this, uh, this operator here that I will use uh, uh, many times, okay. <laughs> but um, okay. So uh, what does give you uh, this lemma? It gives you, uh, in fact, an implicit equation for your solution. Because you see that your solution is equal to something that also depends here on uh, the solution itself. But the insight is that you uh, basically want to have uh, some kind of uh, stability of the support, and uh, you will make some sense along that, which is uh, that this sign is going to stay constant locally. And if this sign stays constant, of course. Then you have the explicit e equation because you have x star that is equal to something that you know. Okay, so what uh, will uh, this give you? So uh, if you are given some uh, y observation, you compute the solution with your favorite uh, solver, then you compute the sign and the support, and you define exactly using the previous equation uh, this uh, basically this equation. So the regression plus a little bias. And what you know is when lambda bar and y bar is equal to lambda and to y, of course you recover the solution because it's by definition of the fixed point equation. But what is more interesting is that this formula is going to be true around <coughs> the solution. More precisely, of course it's not going to be true everywhere because at some point uh, you will have some kind of jump of the support, you will have a change of the support. Uh, for instance, if you uh, increase too much lambda, it goes to zero. Of course, the support has to change. But inside, outside, sorry, a set of hyperplane that you can actually determine explicitly. I have the equation for this hyperplane. It's a little bit nasty, so I don't put them in this slide, but you can actually compute uh, basically the equation of these hyperplanes. Uh, you uh, have, in, in fact, this uh, exact expression of the local behavior of the solution. Okay? So once again, the is determining the equation of this hyperplane and showing that it's actually true outside uh, the hyperplane. So you can look in the paper uh, for this. So what does this tell you? It uh, tells you some very intuitive thing, is that uh, the solution of this uh, analysis regularization is actually a piecewise affine mapping, both uh, piecewise affine uh, on uh, the parameter lambda. So as you move lambda, it will describe a piecewise, uh, in fact, a polygonal pass, and also piecewise affine, uh, with respect to the observation. And it's piecewise because sometimes you have break when you change of support. Okay, the only uh, little bit tricky part is the fact that, of course, the solution is not necessarily unique. Okay? So sometimes you might have some kind of a split in families of solutions which are themselves uh, piecewise affine. It's kind of, uh, in fact, a multivaluate piecewise affine mapping. Okay? So it's exactly a generalization of something that is very well known in a traditional uh, synthesis process. And a typical application of this, there are many applications, but maybe the most uh, known one is to use this to estimate sure and bias risk estimator. Uh, because once you know, uh, in fact, the derivative of this mapping, it's very easy because the derivative is just this, you can plug this in the sure formula to have an uh, unbiased estimator of the risk. I don't put the formula, but it's exactly the sure, additional sure formula that is very useful to uh, set up the parameter in a regularization theory. Okay? So now I want to move to more complicated settings where I don't want only to control the local behavior, but I want to have some kind of robustness to small noise. So of course it's very much related to, uh, to this, because when you want robustness to small noise, you want in some sense some kind of Lipschitz condi condition on the mapping, but there are some uh, difficulties here uh, to stress. So uh, for this, uh, I will introduce uh, my criteria, 
which I call uh, IC for identifiability criteria. So uh, we will see in the proof uh, why this naturally uh, uh, appears here. Uh, it's a little bit complicated because this criteria to compute it, given some kind of sign of the correlation, you actually need to solve a small uh, convex problem. Okay? And this is a departure from uh, the synthesis case, because in the synthesis case, you don't have this minimization because the kernel is reduced to zero. So D is equal to identity. Here, because the correlation operator might have some kernel, and in practice it has a huge kernel, it's very important. Think about TV, uh, of course, the 2D TV has a huge kernel, uh, because it's uh, twice as many uh, correlation than the number of, of pixels in your image. Uh, then, actually, this minimization is very important when you want to study uh, stability. Okay. And this matrix, which should awful, which appear very naturally in the proof, and as you see, it makes use of uh, the A matrix that I have defined uh, previously. But everything you can compute, if you give me some kind of a sign patterns of the correlation, I can give you uh, this indicator here. Okay. And the theorem, which is an exact uh, generalization of the theorem of, uh, of Jean-Jacques Fuchs, um, is the fact that you will have a local, you will have a robustness to the noise, but if the noise is small enough. Okay. So basically, if your IC criteria is smaller than one, okay, and if the noise signal to noise ratio is uh, in fact large enough, okay, <coughs> then if you select carefully your lambda, and there is a constant here, but basically it has to be proportional to the noise level, it's very intuitive, uh, then you will see that uh, the equation given before okay, is actually uh, exactly the solution uh, of your problem. Meaning that the solution of your problem in particular will, will share exactly the same support. Okay, and uh, here there is a this little bias and this little impact of the noise. Okay, so it's very good. I mean, if the noise is very small, uh, everything is fine. Uh, you won't deviate too much from x0. Uh, and of course, since this guy is proportional to the noise, since this guy is proportional to the noise, uh, basically, uh, the error you're making is proportional to the noise. Okay, and as I say, it's, uh, it's strictly a generalization. So in the paper of uh, Jean-Jacques Fuchs, you have to look a little bit because it's not stated as a theorem, but it's actually true, you have proved exactly uh, this theorem. Okay, so, uh, and I want to give a sketch of the proof because it's very interesting because it exactly uh, insists on the stability of the support. And here, it's very important to, to impose the stability of the support, which in some sense, of course, is the weakness of the proof, because sometimes you might have stability without uh, stability of the support. But to my knowledge, nobody has uh, ever been able to do some kind of proof without opposing stability. So I recall that we impose that we have a local invertibility on uh, the space. And uh, what is for me the fundamental lemma, which is some kind of a fault theorem, I think, uh, but it's actually tricky to prove, is the fact that if you have local stability, and if uh, the dual variable do not saturate, then in fact you have a unique solution. So it's an, an implication, you don't have the converse implication, and it's very powerful because it's useful to know that uh, you have the unique solution. If I go back, uh, oops, sorry, you see that here, I have the IC smaller strictly than one, give you the weakness. Okay? So basically, I want just to prove that I don't saturate and I will also have a uniqueness, which is a good bonus. Uh, so the idea is exactly the same as before. I will start by the implicit equation and I will <coughs> use this as a tool to, uh, to construct the solution. So I just plug in exactly the formula uh, I've already introduced before, the support and the sign of my unknown signal, my input signal, and I want to prove that this guy here, so, which I'm calling the remaining uh, x hat, is actually uh, the unique solution of the problem. Okay? So, I simply uh, use my previous uh, implicit equation, I want to show that this implicit equation, when I plug the, the sign pattern of, of the signal, is actually the true solution, which might not always be true, but if the IC criteria is uh, smaller than one, we will, show, we will see that it's actually true. So, the two steps you need to do to prove this, is first you need to prove that uh, X hat has the correct sign pattern. Okay, and of course, for this to be true, you have to control uh, the signal to noise uh, ratio. So you simply, uh, it's very easy, you simply look at uh, the formula for your X hat. If you want this guy to have the same sign as this guy, uh, you have to control the infinite norm of the, of the basic wall here. And uh, basically, if you do this carefully, you simply have some constant times the noise, some constant times lambda, that uh, has to be smaller than the amplitude of the signal. And if this is true, then this guy and this guy will have the, the same sign. So this will uh, define my first condition. This is the easy part. The second part, which is a little bit more tricky and where actually the IC criteria will come into play, is uh, you also want, of course, X hat to obey the first order condition. 
and the first order condition, you have to prove that there exists some kind of a dual certificate with uh, L infinity norms if it's smaller than one. Okay, and it's not very difficult, but you need to do a little uh, computation. You need to plug into this formula the complicated formula that defines this hat. Okay, and after rearranging all the terms, you see that it's equivalent to having this kind of uh, equality. Okay, where I have introduced uh, two matrices, pi and omega. Okay, and uh, if you want this sigma to have uh, an infinite norm that is smaller than one, uh, just uh, apply by this condition. So same thing, you have some constant times the noise level, some constant time lambda that have to be this time that is smaller than zero. Okay, so just manipulation, classic algebraic manipulation of, of the condition. And you see that here, magically, there is this IC criteria that appears, and the IC is just a mix here of the, of the omega matrix uh, here. And it has to be smaller than one for this to make sense. Okay, so you see that if this equation and this equation, sorry, holds, C1 and C2 will be true, and X hat will be actually the solution. So let me just uh, rephrase this. So I have actually two, uh, in fact, uh, linear inequality to be satisfied. One is for uh, actually uh, the sign to be correct. So this is uh, defined here on the left part of this blue line. And here is for the first order condition to be correct. So this is defined another uh, here region. So you see that there is this little triangle that is here, which is a triangle of, uh, that you are allowed to be in uh, over lambda and the noise level. So if both lambda and the noise level are correctly in this triangle, then x hat is the solution. And this is exactly, exactly what I have uh, told. So basically, uh, when the noise is smaller than this point, okay, and this point of course is uh, proportional to t, okay, you see that you can be inside uh, the triangle, and you see that you can choose lambda here to be proportional to the noise, uh, and you will be inside this triangle. Just, draw, you can just drawing and you see that exactly the condition hold and you can actually compute the constants uh, I think I gave them uh, okay, they are nasty but you have constants involved in uh, explicit constants okay, and this implies uh, when the noise goes to zero that you have a linear convergence of zero to zero uh, with the noise so it's a kind of a very uh, simple but still interesting for business when we have small noise so uh, this is good because actually this will also implies uh, identifiability. So when the noise goes to zero, using exactly the same proof, you will prove that in fact x uh, is zero, so the signal is the unique solution of the uh, noiseless optimization problem. Why? There is uh, three steps. First of all, you take W equal to zero in the previous theorem. So you know that when lambda is small enough, you actually know the solution. And it's unique, by the way. Then when lambda tends to zero, this guy tends to x zero, because the bias uh, Vanish, and you can prove that uh, if you have a family of solutions of the relaxed problem, they will converge to a solution of the non-relaxed problem. This is quite easy. So this, this gives you that x0 is the solution of the uh, noiseless problem. And the last part, which is actually the most tricky part, is to prove that it's actually the unique solution. So if all the Lagrangian problems have a unique solution, in fact, the uh, non-Lagrangian problems, the constraints problem, will also have a unique solution. And there is a beautiful trick here, it's just to reverse in some sense uh, the problem, and instead of having minus lambda, you put this in the uh, opposite uh, direction, plus lambda, and this way you will uh, uh, create a problem, so with x1, uh, where x0 will be the solution for the lambda, so you reverse the rules. And it's good because you know that then x0 will be the unique solution of uh, this relaxed problem using the, the previous theorem, and then with, with a little computation, this will imply that x0 is also the unique solution of the lambda. So here the trick is to actually uh, use twice, in fact, the, the problem, the, the previous term. Once here and once here, for two different, two different uh, observations. Okay? So this is not very good. So now uh, I want to go to uh, more stability, having stability to an arbitrary uh, good and noise. So it's going to be very similar to uh, the small noise of stability, except now I, I cannot accept um, I cannot make the assumption that the solution will have exactly the same sign. Okay, when you have uh, small noise, it can be true, but when you have large noise, this can impact the size, the signs pattern too much, and the sign might change. So it was exactly the idea of, uh, of uh, Joel Trop that defined this uh, exact recovery criteria. Here, the corresponding criteria for uh, the analysis case is slightly more involved because you have to control all possible sign patterns. 
effect, which means I do to the maximum of all possible sun patterns that appears when I take signals in my subspace. So it's kind of a combinatorial problem because uh, if you think about TV, if you have K discontinuities, here there will be 2 to the power 2K sign pattern to check, which might be a lot. So uh, I will show you later how you can actually upper bound this, but if you really want the sharp criteria, so this RC criteria, there is some kind of uh, computation involved, which might be uh, intensive if you have uh, a very large sign pattern. But this is inherent to the problem. Okay, and then the theorem is the exact generalization of the theorem of uh, Joel Trop, except now we uh, don't assume that the dictionary is a quantity. So basically, if your criteria is smaller than uh, one, for all, uh, all signals that have the, the same support uh, here, uh, you will have uh, robustness for an arbitrary Hindenburg noise, which means that you can actually select the regularization parameter to be proportional to the noise level. Okay, and uh, the, the problem will have a unique solution. This solution will be supported inside the same subspace, so we share the, the same uh, support, maybe not the same sign pattern, but the same support. And we will have a bound here, uh, exactly the same, it's not the same constant, but we will bound uh, the error proportionally to the noise. So everything is kind of a friendly here. But of course, this criteria uh, has to work. Okay, I won't give the proof, it's exactly, it's very, very similar to the, to the previous uh, proof, but there is once again a proof. Uh, trick here, which is uh, exactly the trick used by uh, Joel uh, Trop in his paper, is uh, you have to in fact make a guess about what's going to be the solution, and the guess is because you, ask, you want to prove that um, the support stays the same, you just restrict the minimization to the support. Okay, you say, okay, I will do uh, a restricted uh, optimization problem, uh, the support. I call the x hat uh, the solution of this problem, and now I want to prove that this x hat is in fact the unique solution of the problem. And if you do this, of course you will win because by construction, this app is a has a good support. Okay, and the difficult part is to show that this is a unique solution. So once again, you have to prove that sign equality holds. This is easy, and also that first order condition holds. And for the first order condition to hold, so if you don't know the sign pattern, uh, you have to use, uh, in fact, the worst case analysis, so the worst case sign pattern. And this is why uh, the definition of RC involves maximization of all possible sign patterns. So RC is in some sense considering the worst sign that can appear. Okay, so uh, what is in some sense nasty is that this RC criteria is in some sense combinatorial because you need to explore all possible sign patterns. Okay, of course you can upper bound this by considering all possible sign patterns, possibly of a sign that uh, doesn't that will never appear as correlation. Okay, so you consider all possible signs which is might be larger than the sign of true signals. Uh, I will show an example later. And uh, still, this is a combinatorial uh, optimization problem. And, and of course, then you can upper bound everything by saying that uh, the u here is zero in the kernel, so you don't take into account the kernel. Uh, and then, then this becomes uh, explicit. You just have a matrix norm. But remember that you make error at each step. This is an error because, of course, you're considering the worst case and pattern. And here, uh, you don't consider the kernel. And for many analysis problems, actually, the kernel is very important. So let me just show some uh, very simple uh, numerical uh, illustrations there. Okay. They are 1D, just to show what you can do. Of course, uh, you could do more complicated, uh, uh, in some sense, benchmark of, of, of this uh, of 2D problems, for instance. But still, in 1D, it's interesting. So first of all, with total variation, actually, this is a total disaster. Okay? For uh, TV, you cannot assume, basically, that you will have robustness of the support. Why? Because there is this famous staircasing effect. And this is just an illustration. So let me give, in fact, some kind of a theorem. Because for TV, it's easy. For 1D TV, sorry. Uh, for 1D TV, it's easy. Because uh, the denoising case, you can actually compute everything. You can compute explicitly the dual uh, vector. And the dual vector is just, in fact, a linear interpolation of the sign patterns. So here, if you are going up like this and down like this, you will have a linear interpolation like this of the two sign here, plus one and minus one. So basically, in the case, Friendly case where you have uh, alternation of up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Because of the linear interpolation, you will see that the blue dot will never saturate. So you will have, have actually robustness to small noise. But uh, in the more general case where you can have up and up, okay, then the uh, trend vector will saturate here, which means that actually the criteria will be exactly equal to 1. And what does it mean? It means you have no robustness. Even if the noise is as small as possible, with TV uh, denoising, you will al always observe some kind of a very small jump inside the middle here. Uh, 
here on the support. Okay, but it's kind of a built-in in the TV uh, regularization. So, uh, okay, it doesn't mean TV is not good for the noise, it just means TV is not good if you want to recover exactly the set of discontinuities. But those who know TV know exactly this. Thing. Very, very well known that you have to start using uh, TV. So what people do also in statistics is kind of a, of a mix, of a hybrid be between TV and L1. And the goal here is to model signal that appears in uh, disjoint blocks. Okay? So you will have blocks because TV will force some kind of piecewise constant behavior. And you will have an uh, isolated block because you penalize by some kind of epsilon, the L1 norm. The typical signal is actually a uh, sum of these of blocks. Sometimes they can overlap, but most of the time they will be uh, disjoint. So then this is much more friendly, because in some sense the L1 here will uh, stabilize the support, and you can actually prove that you have uh, uh, here the RCP carrier that uh, is smaller than one in denoising, and we have also done some tests in compressed sensing. So here it's a very simple signal, just to understand. So the signals that have uh, just an indicator of, uh, of an interval, so uh, here is a display of how this criteria evolves as the problem becomes, uh, becomes uh, more and more difficult. So on the left it's uh, very difficult, and here you have more and more measurements in compressed sensing. So of course when you have a lot of measurements, uh, the criteria tends to uh, go smaller than one. Okay? And also you notice that in this case, because I choose a small epsilon, so in some sense the norm is not very uh, active here, uh, this signal here is simpler to recover than this one. Of course, if you use uh, epsilon that is large, you penalize more the epsilon, the role will be reversed because this signal is more sparse than this one, so this one uh, would be would have a better criteria, so better stability. So depending on, on the epsilon, you have actually different conclusion, and the conclusion is that generally the fuse vaso is has a stability uh, of the support and robustness to strong noise. Okay, so as a conclusion, the first point I wanted to make clear uh, the distinction between uh, what's called synthesis sparsity, which is very popular and very well used at least in image processing, and the analysis uh, sparsity, which I think is also uh, very popular, but people don't think about it, but TV, I mean, it's almost everywhere at image processing, so I think it's very important to understand carefully what TV and, and regularization like this are doing, and uh, what I wanted to show is that you can, in fact, shed some light on this behavior by using similar <coughs> tools, so support recovery, support stability, okay, and you can prove in some cases, I mean, not uh, uh, everywhere, but in some cases you can actually have robustness. Um, what is clear is that okay, there are some limitations here. And basically, uh, the observation we make by this uh, simple example is that generally the support of analysis tends to be uh, much less robust. Okay, and it makes sense uh, because in some sense you have much more uh, subspaces to explore. Even in TV you have a huge set of, of, of subspaces and if you go to 2D it's even worse. Um, but the good point is that uh, once you have recovered uh, the support, then the stability is very strong because most of the time uh, the linear space uh, GJ are very small. Like if you think about the fused lasso, uh, if you have three or four bumps, it's just a uh, three-dimensional space. Whereas if you want to use uh, only L1, if the intervals are very large, you are in a much larger dimension. So uh, to conclude, I would say analysis, um, identifying the support is more complicated, but then when you have identified the support, of course you are much more robust because you are in a much smaller uh, dimension. And I think a key open problem uh, in the community here is to try to analyze, uh, analyze robustness without, uh, without having such a strong uh, constraint on the support. So maybe some kind of partial robustness, some kind of partial uh, support identifiability. But you don't identify exactly the support. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Questions for Gabriel? Thanks, Roger, for uh, your interesting talk. A question about the uh, robust list uh, with the uh, bulk noise. So, um, the bulk noise means that some of the signal um, uh, magnitude is smaller than the noise level. Is that? So, uh, just to be. So, in the strong. I'm not sure I answered your question, but. Uh, because, so, uh, so in this case, when you uh, want to have uh, robustness to small noise, because you want to extract exactly the good sign pattern, your signal needs to be above the noise. Right? Right. But this is for this theorem, which is kind of a, a very strong theorem in some sense. You are looking for a local robustness, but then you have the exa exact equation of the solution. But still, it's interesting because I think in many applications, you actually don't have that much noise. And in deconvolution, I think this is the correct theorem to use. Because the second theorem... Okay, this theorem, sorry. <coughs> Sorry, oops. This theorem, there's no assumption on, 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 on the signal level. 
because some of the components they might disappear. You only you know you are having uh, the support of the solution is inside the good support. It may be strictly included, meaning some of the correlations they might actually go to zero. But uh, okay, there's no hope. If you have noise infinity, the solution will be zero. And, but zero is good. Zero is inside the so uh, here there's no assumption on the signal to noise. The only assumption is you have to make the regularization parameter proportional to the noise. Okay? But the problem is that of course this RC criteria uh, is much more is much uh, worse than the previous one. I mean in some sense you have uh, the side criteria which is good, the support criteria which is not that good, and then the correlation criteria like in the top of Rodolphe, which is even worse because then you want this to be true for all sparse signals. So you have this kind of three embedded criteria. For application, depending on the noise level, uh, you have to use a different time. And I think for uh, deconvolution, so for imaging problem, when you have no noise, I think the good one is actually the first one. Because you actually want to detect exactly the good sign. Another question for Gabriel? I have one. That's more comment. Uh, I think the, the open problem for going this identity has been solved like a but a few years ago by Mikkel, Ritov and Sinakov for their uh, simple estimation consistency, which is essentially by the goal of obviousness to noise, without using uh, support recovery. Yeah, but this is the RIP method. It's RIP. RIP. Yeah, this is for all the methods. Yeah, sure. But just just to make clear, my talk is not about compressed sensing. With, with compressed sensing, you can have much better... I, don't mean, that, I mean that the, the criteria had a sufficient condition for uh, estimation and obviousness to noise. Which you can compute, sure, but which is not understood. So it may be possible to extend those kind of RIP, not RIP. Uh, RIP okay. in that case of D being. The criteria are so bad on natural works. I mean, for me, this criteria should be really restricted to random matches. I mean, try to estimate them. Even on random matches, they are not that good, but they are good as a topic. But uh, criteria you like. Are good, hard to compute, or not like. Even estimate, you can estimate them by Monte Carlo, like RIP or RIP. And you will see with convolution matrix, you're dead. I mean, okay, we can discuss, but uh, for me, these criteria are more. But this is very interesting, but this is a separate uh, work. It's about dealing with random matrix phi. And, a bit, and of course, with random matrix phi. Yeah. In statistics, uh, we don't really care so much about random matrices. So the design is given, and we want to find sufficient conditions under which uh, the method is working. So possibly, those criteria are hard to compute, but actually, we need. Uh, so much sharp results. It's not only that they are bad to compute, it's also they are very bad on, on deterministic matrix like convolution, like natural images, like dictionary learning. I mean, uh, I mean the sparsity you can draw is like below two, below one. I mean, no, no, really, really. I mean, should I did the computation. Should so this, may, this may be uh, it's only something on. that is hard place to try to do. Uh, no, it's not hard place because you can have in some ideas of how to do this, but. Uh, if you have a support, but if this support is included in a, a slightly larger support which actually uh, verifies this criteria, the problem is you don't know actually how to compute this extended support. But uh, because in TV, you will always know that there will be a break in the middle of the interval. But there will be only one break. I'm willing to bet that for this identity, your criterion is uh, stricter than the one uh, from Bullman and uh, Van de Beer, which is somewhat the tightest one. This is a, I mean, this is a necessarily a sufficient condition. Not for all that, for obviousness to noise. Yeah, for obviousness to noise. Yes, yeah, it's a whole point. No, no, but it's okay. Maybe we can take this off now. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. Any more comments or questions? Okay, so.